<laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Carol Scott. I'm with the National Ombudsman Resource Center, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar for new and nearly new and mentors, um, State Ombudsman, um, building relationships with your program representatives. Um, we're glad to have you with us. This is an hour and a half webinar, and so the first thing I would do is, would be to ask you to get up and close your door or take your pencil and throw it across the room. Um, and just sit back and listen as much as possible, although you might want your pencil handy in case you want to take some notes. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions in the uh, toolbox on the right-hand side of your screen, um, there's a place for questions. You can type in those questions, and we will get to those. Um, if, it, if you don't have that toolbox, you should see a little orange arrow. You can click on that and that will bring your toolbox up and you can type in a question. We also will have time at the end so that um, we will unmute lines and people can have a conversation. Um, we are hoping to accomplish three things today um, to learn some strategies for building those relationships and um, friendships and working uh, matters um, with your local staff, whether they be um, your direct employees or whether they are um, staff with other organizations. Um, we're going to talk about why it's important to have that relationship, and I'm sure that um, you guys probably um, have some ideas of your own. And then we're going to be, we, we, we are always cognizant that there are um, some people just um, we, we either don't get along with or um, have other ideas, and as the leader of this uh, program, it's important to maybe think about um, w when those situations happen, how can I still have the best relationships so that the residents um, end up with the best possible care. Um, we did. Uh, I did send out an email earlier this morning that you all should have received that has um, all of the handouts. Um, we will be sending those out again after this webinar, um, probably early next week, um, with a recording of, of this webinar. Um, first, we're going to start off with a couple of polling questions. So the first question is, is um, which, which camp are you in? And just go ahead and uh, vote with your computer here that you've um, worked um, you've already worked with the Ombudsman program before or you're new to this and um, you're you know having trouble even saying the word Ombudsman. Um, so if everybody will vote, looks like we're about 50 percent, um, 75 percent, 83 percent. This is just to give uh, our speakers kind of an idea of where um, and, and who they're talking to. So um, we're going to close the poll in about five seconds if you haven't uh, voted. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And it looks like 80% um, of you have uh, um, worked with the Ombudsman program before, and 20% uh, um, are, um, I don't want to really say deer in the headlights, but that might be the, the closest. Um, description. Um, our next um, poll is to ask you, um, are the program reps, um, are they direct employees or, or are they employees of another agency, whether a AAA um, or a self-standing ombudsman program? Um, and so, Oh, you guys are getting quick now. I'm pretty impressed. Um, can give you five seconds. Probably should have done these throughout the webinar, and then we'd see if we were really playing, paying attention here. I'm um, going to close. I'm going to share. Fifty-five percent of you have the. Oh man, isn't that nice to have direct employees? Forty-five percent of you um, have uh, employees from another agency that you're working with. Um, and then the 
third poll is um, have you met your reps in person? Um, yes, I've met all of them. Yes, I've met some of them. No, not yet, but it's on my to-do list. Or, wow, I just started. Give me some time. And again, this is just to kind of see where you are so that when we're having some conversation, you're out. Um, You know, uh, and, and when you're talking, we'll know that it um, looks like most of you have met all and some of you have met some. I'm going to close in five seconds. Okay, so 64% of you have, uh, and I will tell you that this is a very small sample. <laughs> Um, and I probably should have told the mentors not to be voting, but maybe, uh, but that's okay if you guys are, that's fine. Um, and uh, so 64% have met all of your people, 36% have met some. So thank you for um, participating in the, um, in the poll. Um, our agenda today is to um, welcome you all, and actually I want to, um, jump in and share my webcam, hi, um, and to just, uh, so that you'll know um, who I am and what my office background looks like. And Katie and Amity, if you guys want to jump in so that we can um, see you, that would be great. Um, I think it's, there's, uh, that's Katie, and then that's Amity, so that when we see you all in person, you can, um, make us shake our head and go, okay, where's my name tag? Because how come these people know me and I don't know them? So we're very happy to have you. Um, Katie is in uh, Washington, D.C., and Amity is in, oh my gosh, Seattle, is that right? Portland. Portland or C Portland? Portland, okay. Um, Portland, Oregon. Um, so we're in the Pacific time zone, central time zone, and east time zone. But we as you will notice, do everything on East Coast time because I have no idea why they win, but they do. So, um, okay, well, we're going to get off our webcams, but just wanted to say hey to you and um, so that you'll know who we are and what we look like. Um, okay, webcam, stop sharing. Okay, bye. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, the good working relationships and why they're important. Um, our two speakers today are Ann Meyer from Colorado and Victor Origia from North Carolina. We're going to talk about some tips for developing relationships, um, tips for overcoming those challenging situations. We're going to have questions and answers, and then we're going to close. Um, we have, over the years, um, the Resource Center has done this type of training for new ombudsmen. Um, and these are some thoughts that came from some of those previous webinars that we held with new ombudsmen. And you can see here that, um, that one of the thoughts um, is that seeing, having them see you in their area is very important. Um, and that, that the local people want to know that you're going to stand up for them when they need it and that you'll grab your keys and you'll go to them um, if they ask. Um, and it's really important that you look up or know the technical information that they need to, to do their job. And I'll tell you, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. Um, I had one of the biggest compliments um, when I first started when, when uh, a person said, you are the first state employee who ever told me they didn't know, but they'd get back to me, rather than just trying to make up an answer. So um, I've kind of held on to that all these years. Um, and then making sure that the local folks know that they're going to um, they're going to get the the phone call back um, they're going to get a response to, uh, to their email um, even if all it is is i have i'll have to get back to you but um, them knowing that you, that you're holding them um, up to a higher level than anybody else is is uh, is good and then passing on that information um, information you get from from NASOP meetings information you get from other meetings um, uh, newsletters, uh, um, they want to know what you're doing, but they also want to know what's going on. And so um, this is a very important um, 
a part of building that uh, relationship um, is, is for them to see communication and information being passed on to them. Um, and there will be times when information will come to you and it will say, please don't pass it on. Well, okay, so then don't pass those on, but other things. Um, this is what one person said. Um, there's a poster that states that only the lead dog on a dog sled gets a change of scenery. Um, my team building with staff is to try and be the lead dog. Let others be the program rep and report back to the group. Leadership versus management. Learn the difference and decide what works for you. So I thought that was a good... Um, a good way of saying that even though we are in charge of the program, that sometimes it's that it's really good to delegate because it um, holds other people um, accountable, and plus it just shows them that, that, that this is a a team effort. Um, learning to say, "Tell me what you're thinking" when they come with a question about what to do, instead of always just telling them. Um, this is really, really key um, to just listen to their story, to, to listen. Um, I found when I was the state ombudsman that um, sometimes they would bring up a question and as they were bringing it up, it's like the answer would be there and they're like, oh, well, you know, blah, 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 you know, I can sit down with the family and this is what I probably ought to say to them. And I would just go, okay, it's good talking to you. It sounds like you've got a good plan there. And they would always think that I had, you know, done something, but all I did was listen. Um, and then, and, and because by listening, you are helping to build up their self-esteem um, and to um, build their confidence. So the handouts that I sent out earlier today um, are the um, are, are wonderful, and I hope that you will print these out and that you will read them. And I want to just take just a second and show you that um, okay that this is the Consumer Voice website that you're seeing here, um, I hope. And notice that everything's blue. If you click on the Ombudsman Resource Center, everything turns green. If you go under Support and Program Management, this is all of these are links. And so you're under Support, Program Management, and you come down to Ombudsman Program Structure and Management. Here are those same handouts. Plus, this is a great um, recording. Um, that's Patty Ducaye from Texas talking about um, relationships between state and local ombudsmen with a really fancy word there with it. So, um, and I won't even try to say it because you guys would laugh and that would hurt my feelings or something. So all of these resources are here under program management structure. Um, so if you misplace the email I sent, um, you now know that you can go into the um, resource center, support, program management, and um, slide down. So. Here are our two speakers. Um, Ann Meyer from Colorado is a fairly new state ombudsman. She is just uh, kind of graduating from um, this group, but maybe still hanging on with her fingertips. Um, and the other person speaking today is Victor from North Carolina. Victor is a uh, longtime state ombudsman, formerly at in the state of um, Delaware, but he's very new in North Carolina. So he's going through some of the same things you all are doing. Um, and so we're going to start with um, we're going to start with Ann, and I am going to give her um, control, and I'm going to open her mic. Uh, Ann, I am. I am awesome. unmuted. You are, and I okay. can see your screen. All right. Well, what a pleasure to be invited to do this. So I really thank uh, you know the folks at NORC and NASOP for allowing me to share some time with you all today. And uh, Carol, I really appreciate that introduction, because I would agree, I feel like I have a foot in both camps. I'm about two and a half years in as state ombudsman. Um, but I am one who came uh, from the outside and not from the inside of the Ombudsman Corps in Colorado. Um, so it was a pretty steep learning curve, those, those first few 
months and frankly years and uh, just earlier this week I had an experience where I thought uh, you know to my chagrin well I didn't really know that um, maybe a little bit about my history I am a social worker by training and I came up through um, the mental health system here in Colorado and my first job ever was as a house parent in a group home with 15 people with major mental illness. Um, we don't even use those terms in Colorado anymore. You can't find a house parent and we don't have group homes that serve people with mental illness. Um, but that was a great experience because what it did was inform my value system of um, I don't come at things as a professional, I come at things as um, an ally. I'm going to come alongside and listen to what's going on for you and then do what I can to help you get to your right solution. Um, after several years working within the mental health system, both in that group home setting as well as in nursing homes that had people with people with mental illness, I moved to our protection and advocacy program um, and worked for seven years uh, doing protection and advocacy work for people with mental illness. And you all may or may not know what a protection advocacy system is, but I would invite you to introduce yourself to the PNA allies out there um, and, and find out about their work. Uh, I'll, the philosophy is quite similar and you'll, you'll find some um, deep resource there. I then spent a little time uh, working at social services with adults and managing caseworkers. I worked at a hospital as a case manager, which is code talk for discharge planner. Most recently was a hospice social worker and in and out of facilities quite often. And um, from that job was offered this position, as I said, two and a half years ago. In Colorado, we have a structure unique to the nation in that the long-term care ombudsman program is actually housed at the protection and advocacy program. Um, so I work for Disability Law Colorado on a contract to the state. There's a second funding stream that goes to our AAAs to employ um, the local advocates. We have lead ombudsmen in our 16 AAAs and they then have ombudsman staff. Um, so I am in that new federal rules situation of having programmatic responsibility but not personnel oversight and happy to talk about that with anyone because I'm kind of wading my way through that as well. And um, maybe at this point we can kind of jump into slides. So some of the challenges that I found, uh, and I've just mentioned that, uh, when I came and I started reading the Older Americans Act and then our Colorado law and, and the policy and procedure manual and I started realizing, holy smokes, we have 225 nursing homes, we have oh, about 650 assisted livings, we serve about 42,000 residents between those two, there are 65 ombudsmen, um, some volunteers, some part-time and some full-time. You mush them all together and it makes about 37 FTE to protect those 40,000 people. And quite frankly, I was really swamped by just the responsibility of all that. Um, had, to, had to think hard about what I had gotten myself into. Um, as one who came from the outside and not from inside the ombudsman program. I definitely uh, encountered, as I went around and visited local programs, the you don't know how hard it is, you never did this job. But I would remind each and every person that uh, some of you did, according to our poll, come from inside programs. And I actually did come from seven years of advocacy as a former protection and advocacy employee myself. Um, and it really is OK just to say, well, I, I can imagine how hard it is. Tell me more about what you're experiencing. Let me, let me hear it from you. Um, Colorado is a big state and, and we have a lot of facilities, so it's um, sort of a lot to keep in mind. And I'm pleased to tell you that while I could not keep the 16 AAA regions in sight in the first three months. I now can tell you the names of all of our ombudsmen and many of the facilities and 
as goes in complaint resolution. I'm more familiar with the names and dynamics of those facilities that are troubled than the facilities that are performing highly, but it, it comes, it comes to you. Uh, the second piece that I tripped on, it's fun to talk about where you fall down, the whole route to becoming a certified ombudsman. So I had to, um, in our state, we have a training. It's very thin training requirements when I came to this job. There is a manual that you would read and then complete tests. You then had a, a um, requirement to shadow and reverse shadow a certified ombudsman. And if you had done that for 15 hours and completed the test and gone through the answers you got wrong, then you could be an ombudsman. So an example of uh, not knowing what you don't know, we're in a long-term care facility. And I was seven years in hospice social work, which is a pretty hands-on type job. And um, walking down the hallway, and a gentleman beckons to me. I walked in his room. And he had his breakfast tray mostly eaten in front of him. And he said, you know, I'd like to lay down now. So I'm using his little, you know, automatic button controller to lay the head of the bed down. And the certified ombudsman who's training me comes in and, you know, no, no, no. We, we don't do that. We can't do that. We're not trained to that. And, uh, uh, you know, kind of set me straight on the... Um, part of being an ombudsman, which is being clear about what you do and don't have training on. Now, because of my background, I did, but in this role, I don't, and I, I overstepped. I made a mistake. So it was good. It was good. Um, and believe me, that was not the only one. Uh, I found it hard to become a subject matter expert on everything that touches long-term care quickly. Uh, as soon as I think, like I figured out what the the SOM was and how to use the state operation manual for nursing homes, then someone would ask me a question about um, personal needs allowance. So then I'd try to go figure that out, and the next question would come in about rights of people in um, assisted living who are being discharged. So then I had to learn that, and I felt like I was flying from one subject to another and not um, I, really becoming master of none, jack of all trades, master of none, and trying to find a way to organize what felt to me a vast amount of information in a way that my brain could understand it and retrieve it quickly, whether it was on my computer or in my mind about who I needed to go to for what kinds of questions. Um, while this has not much to do with engaging your local ombudsman, it does have a lot to do with understanding the lay of their land. In Colorado, and I presume most of the country, uh, AAAs are found in three different kinds of entities. Uh, for us, it's councils of government, which are sort of big organizations that hold quasi-governmental agencies, like ombudsmen, like transportation, like uh, waste and disposal. Um, the second place AAAs are found is in um, County Department of Human Services, and the third is in uh, freestanding nonprofits. And so understanding that my ombudsmen are responding to three different kinds of settings and therefore three different kinds of um, accountability upward, whether it's a board of directors or county assemblymen, um, I needed to understand that level of stakeholder. And in Colorado, we are very much a local control state. So what works in Denver is not going to work in Colorado Springs. And it's really different from Steamboat Springs. And um, uh, it seems like it should be uniform. And it's just not. So here's my first day on the job. Orientation was great. Where do you want me to start? I'm kind of busy. Maybe you can look at the website and guess what you should be doing. <laughs> and then he develops a hump. Um, that's really what it felt like. So I was busy my first week reading that manual, doing my shadowing, met with my boss here at the Protection and Advocacy Program. My very first four hours were actually at a presentation with the AAA directors. Kathy Greenlee was here in Colorado. Um, and feel free to ask me in the question and answer if you're not sure who that is. Uh, she had been here for a big conference, but had agreed to speak with the AAA directors and allied programs. So I started with a bang. But come Friday of my first week, 
they said, here's your office, and there's a whole bunch of boxes and a whole bunch of piles of paper, and I'm looking and trying to figure it out. And then people just kind of walked away. And so I'm, I'm thinking, well, all right, figure out where stuff is. Nothing's in file drawers. Nothing was labeled. So I start reading, and I am get through a couple of boxes. And then uh, here at the state program in Colorado, it's myself, and I have a program assistant. So we're statewide support program of two for the 65 ombudsmen in Colorado. And we talk a little bit, and oh, I don't know. I started in March and probably November following. I found a box that said, uh, this is where you should start. And inside was sort of all the ombudsman 101 information I needed um, that I had found in the meantime. So how did I get to know Locals and Leads? And I'm going to go quickly through this because uh, you saw the information that Carol presented. Uh, I adore the assistant that I inherited, and I cannot believe I got so lucky because she had been an ombudsman and then had worked here in the state program for seven years. And um, it took me a while to appreciate the the depth of knowledge and the integrity of spirit that she had, but I was really lucky and I bet in everybody's program you have those kind of people, whether it's your assistant or out somewhere in the state who's the same person for you. Um, one of the things I do in Colorado, uh, if you look down to the fourth bullet, you see that we have an annual conference, which is our certification training. and. Um, most all the ombudsmen come to that. There are always people who aren't able to make it and have to make up training some other way. But uh, the state has made a concerted effort, um, the various programs across the state, to have attendance there. On top of that, with the ombudsman, I try to have regular training calls. Mm, probably, if I'm being honest, it should be monthly, and it's really every other month, uh, in point of fact. Uh, I recently decided to split out general training calls, like what is the survey process, and then calls specific to lead ombudsmen so that we can talk about, oh, federal rule implementation, or um, we recently had a change in our advanced directive law here in Colorado. So talk about that so that they could bring that to their local programs. Um, that's the place where I talk about ombuds manager quite often. And, and trying to build some capacity that way. I am one who does believe in physical presence. And um, in my first year, I'm on a three-year program evaluation cycle with the 16 programs across the state. Uh, I came in March, and our fiscal year is done in June. And it turns out that none of the program evaluations for that current year had occurred. And the former ombudsman was great, because she took me around and kind of did that alongside me for the first few so that I could get to understand both program evaluation as well as meet local ombudsmen at the same time. So we got five programs reviewed in two months' time. And then July 1st came, and I start met the five more programs through the course of that next fiscal year. But I had committed uh, to Colorado that I would try to get to every program and meet every ombudsman. I was not able to quite get that done in my first year, but I had accomplished it within the first 18 months. I had visited, uh, I think I counted over 40 facilities while doing that, um, and also went to back up various uh, difficult situations that had come up for ombudsmen during that time. Um, you might remember Carol threw up a, a bullet point that talked about you know, offering information, and making sure people know what's going on, and what are your activities, and what have you been doing, and what's going on in the world. And I have worked very hard to do that. Um, I mentioned building the lead ombudsman group. I, our structure does not have regionals, so I rely on my 16 lead ombudsmen to disseminate information. And um, in Carol's introduction, she talked about what I'm going to term power sharing finding your experts and, and letting them come forward. Um, I'm doing that with my training conference, which is next month. And I actually have uh, leads and some longtime local ombudsmen doing portions of presentation in areas where I think they are experts across the state and that we could all learn from them. Things like how to work with someone with mental illness, 
what to do when a facility closes. We had a closure this last year. Um, uh, we had an ombudsman involved in a uh, um, facility evacuation for a natural disaster and have her share that experience. But leaning on the leads and locals where they are expert. Uh, I am a talker, but I strive to listen. Um, try very hard to make myself available. Uh, I have given my cell phone to the ombudsman, and I've been impressed with how they have, uh, when calling after hours, doing it when it's appropriate. And I would want to know, and I'm glad they call, but really respecting access and using it well. And my last point on this slide is you've got to tell the truth. Um, Ombudsmen need to know that you know where you're strong and where you're weak and where you have succeeded but also where you failed. And especially as one that needed to build credibility with the group and coming from the outside, uh, if I wasn't really transparent with all of it, the parts I was doing well as, as well as the parts where I was um, oh, taking a little longer to get up to speed, I uh, think I would have lost respect as opposed to gained respect. I uh, have a quote here that I often talk about in my um, presentations to groups because I find that this work is extremely intricate and nuanced and that we all need to be a little bit uh, respectful of the fact that it's not easy what we're trying to do here. And we're going to stay at the table and stay at the conversation until we get to the end. So some of my strategies. Um, Almost every conversation I have with ombudsmen, I ask them whether it's a case conversation or just touching base, what's working well, what doesn't work well. Um, we talked about asking locals what do they expect. And um, I, I was actually with my Boulder program yesterday, and they said, we like that when we call you and we say we'd like to have you at a meeting, you come. And um, I have tried very hard to do that. And I've also tried to invite people to come to meetings I'm attending so that they can see um, maybe beyond a facility intervention to a larger intervention, perhaps with a corporate chain or stakeholders here in Colorado. Uh, I am trying to get better at asking for what I need. I am a terrible person at data entry and often late. And so I therefore feel like a huge hypocrite when I say to them, they've got to get it done. But um, getting more comfortable with that. I, as one who's housed at the Protection and Advocacy Program, I have deep access to experts in disability law. Um, so whether it's a question about Olmstead that affects people in nursing homes, or trying to figure out if someone in an assisted living needs a hearing assessment who's responsible for getting that accomplished. Uh, there are people here in my agency who can help me with that, and I often rely on them. I should mention that uh, when the Ombudsman program came to the Protection and Advocacy program in Colorado, along with it came the legal services developer, and that person has been an immense help to me. Uh, we're getting ready to um, write a white paper and try to find a legislator to change appeal processes for people in nursing homes here in Colorado. And I would not be able to do that without her support. Um, super important, I had to get comfortable with a group of 65 ombudsmen looking at me that sometimes I make mistakes, like when I touch the button for the gentleman in bed. Um, I think I am extremely winning and likable, and it turns out not everyone likes me. And um, if you have 65 people who are working hard and are very experienced, uh, you will never be the best at anything in the program, but you can pull together every single one of those people and create the best program. Uh, one last cartoon, I find humor a good way to cope. We need testing. We've got to figure this out. We've got to get in there. What are their good habits? What are their bad habits? And the fellow responds, we could just leave them alone and let them do their jobs. Uh, and I strive for a good balance of support when necessary, nipping at heels when it's important, and getting out of the way when that's what's called for. Um, so find your own sweet spot. Lead with your strengths. 
Um, if I know that my weak point has to do with my data entry, um, then what I need to do is strategize. I, so what I have is a tickler system on my computer reminders, and I've given my program assistant permission that if I'm more than two weeks out, she needs to be sending me a weekly friendly email reminding me about that. And I find them uncomfortable enough. It's really effective at getting me to catch up. I see I misspelled allies, but look for your allies. Um, I work in an office building on the first floor, and on the fifth floor is our Alzheimer's Association. And um, I have found a couple of folks there who have been tremendous help in terms of just specific questions on behalf of residents, but they also just are good allies in the fight with no conflict of interest. Um, it is easy in a complaint resolution system to uh, get so immersed in what's not working well that it can be hard to notice what's good and what's working well, whether that's uh, elegant intervention on behalf of your ombudsman or systems where they're actually serving people well. But uh, notice it and say it out loud because you are so much more leader than you realize um, across your state. Use your NASOP mentor and, and the new friends that you'll be making as you have joined this group and come to conferences and met people and made phone calls. I hope you would consider me one of those people and, and call me if you had a question. And last piece, please just lift your own head off the desk and take a, a landscape view because this is such important work. This is such good work. The social justice imperative in this work can't be ignored. And um, you are entered into a, a, a great mission by accepting the state long-term care ombudsman. I wanted to tell you about this woman. And I know I'm over time, but I'm going to talk really fast. Uh, this gal is 102, and she lives in northeast Colorado. She told the ombudsman there that she had lived a good long life, and she was pretty tired and ready to die. And in northeast Colorado, um, one of our chains had decided they wanted to build a greenhouse. So our local ombudsman, her name is Marlene. She's been doing this work for 25 years. And uh, Marlene was explaining Greenhouse and how the philosophy was a little bit different and how it was trying to become a little more home-like while still providing a, a good amount of service to people who needed support. And as you can see, she's in a chair. And um, as I said, she's 102. And the next visit the ombudsman made, she stopped by and visited with this resident. And she said, you know what? I, I am ready to die, and if it's my time, I'm OK with it. But I'm pretty interested in what you had to say. And I'd like to take this next project around the bend and watch it happen. The fellow next to her is another resident at her current nursing home. And the fellow in the hard hat is a um, county commissioner. And that's her at the groundbreaking. And um, when I suggest lifting your head and looking around and seeing what's good and appreciating the valiant, uh, the valor in this work. Uh, that's the kind of thing I mean. Uh, thanks for letting me talk. Anne, thank you. Can you? Anne? Yeah. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, you, uh, I think, caused everybody to um, jump up and run uh, across the room and grab their pen that I had them um, uh, throw away uh, so that they would be not multitasking. But um, you hit on, I, I was reliving my experience as, as a state ombudsman um, in every one of the points that you made. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we're going to uh, move from mountain time to east coast time. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to um, turn it over to Victor. Victor, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you going to be flipping the? Yes. OK. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. This is this is Victor Rija from North Carolina. Um, I started my career in the chemical industry, and by chance, I got to the state government, and uh, it has been home ever since. 
Uh, when I joined the chemical industry, um, I did a lot of things, and they have to be downsized. Um, I was still hoping to get back to the chemical industry, but somehow I applied with the state uh, state unit on aging in Delaware, and uh, you know I got uh, you know I got a position there as a contract manager, and I did a lot of things: system change grant, uh, housekeeping uh, contract, um, senior center, and things of that nature. And then you know um, I thought I was going to get back into the chemical industry. Uh, but after doing a lot of things, senior medical patrol, legal services developer, and things not seeing home transition, uh, the parkour to MFP, I decided to stay. And uh, the opportunity came about for me to become the state long term care ombudsman in Delaware. And um, I did that for nine years. And uh, unbeknown to many people, I was commuting from North Carolina to Delaware while I was doing all that. And then, you know, um, I had an opportunity to come to North Carolina to a uh, division of aging and adult services, and uh, I joined on that opportunity. And then, you know, uh, no sooner I got here, I would say about a year or so after I got here, uh, Sharon Wilder, uh, who many of you, the legendary Sharon Wilder, who many of you might know, uh, retired, and uh, she retired uh, effective uh, 1st of March, and I uh, became the interim uh, a long time care ombudsman from then, and uh, it was confirmed uh, at the end of June. So here am I. And I always wanted to come from uh, a small state, Delaware, where every employee was a state employee, into an area where the regional ombudsman were housed within the triple A's. So there's the opportunity. So, uh, next please. So, uh, this is where we are in North Carolina. This is the uh, North Carolina structure uh, is just like a pyramid. Uh, we have in the state office here uh, myself, the state long time care ombudsman, um, an elder rights specialist, and uh, ombudsman uh, program specialist. That position is vacant now because I vacated that position. So we started interviewing today. So there are three people in the state office. Um, if I counted my boss, the elder rights chief, we will be four. So, but you know, for intent and purpose, we are three. And then below that, you have the area agencies on aging. Uh, we have 36 regional long-term care ombudsmen. Uh, there are 100 counties in North Carolina, and they are grouped into 16. So the 36 regional ombudsmen, you know, belong to 36, uh, uh, you know, 16, uh, 16 regions. We have uh, also. Um, below that group there is the uh, uh, the uh, board of county commissioners and then uh, CAC volunteers. We have volunteers almost 1,100 throughout the well, you know, 100 uh, you know uh, counties in North Carolina. So we call them the CAC volunteers. The uh, North Carolina has about uh, 444 nursing homes and uh, almost 51 beds, 51,000 beds. And we have what adult care homes, about 1,255. Uh, that's almost 41,000 beds. When we say adult care homes, there are two are uh, uh, two categories in there, two types. The family care homes, where you have two to six individuals living in that home, and then you have the adult care homes, which is the assisted living, seven plus, uh, you know, residents in a uh, in a in each facility. Go ahead. Next slide. Okay. Uh, building relationship with program representatives. You know, um, who are the representatives? Who are they? Uh, I think I broke them down into two: the internal, and when you look at it, and then the external. The internal being the division of aging and adult services, where we are right now, because we're dealing. We have the fiscal. We have the budget. Uh, we have the uh, legal services developer. And we have some other people that we we interact with, you know, within the uh, state unit on aging, uh, division of aging and adult services. And we also have the uh, the triple A's. Uh, triple A's. When I say internal, the aid agency on aging. This is where we have the 36 uh, regional ombudsmen, and they are throughout the entire state. And they, you know. And then within that, you know, uh, AAA, 
the AAA has the personnel supervision, personnel oversight, while the office will have the program oversight. And then you have the regional ombudsman, you know, 30, you know, 36 of them, and they, they do all the work, you know, of the 51,000, uh, 91,000 uh, residents that I talked about. And then we have the external also, I uh, say, you know, the uh, AAAs, regional ombudsman, the providers, uh, that's long-term care providers and other providers, you know, state and feds, um, and, you know, agencies. And we also look at the uh, ACL, we look at the center, and then we look at the uh, NISO, and then we look at, um, you know, NISA also. So again, these are all, you know, all, all the program representatives that we deal with, you know, we deal with, you know, some more than the other. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, how do we build relationship here? Um, uh, the way I look at it, you know, emails, you know, communication, very, very important. Uh, it could be the emails from, you know, what uh, what I get from uh, Consumer Voice. Uh, it could be the emails from um, uh, from the from our department, Department of Health and the Human Services, or it could be email from uh, our division. Um, and you know, it could be various emails from coffee chain from the survey agencies and all these things are tracked them back to, you know, uh, uh, onto uh, the regional ombudsman. Uh, telephone calls, um, you know, uh, they, they call, I return the calls, you know, so that's one form of, you know, building relationship also. And I think I had and also talk about, you know, the timely, uh, you know, uh, you know, timely response, things of that nature, you know. And we have something that is very important here that is called the mandatory quarterly training. Um, the 136 regional ombudsmen for 100 counties, uh, we meet once a, once a quarter. And what we do, uh, this is mandatory, and if you need to maintain your certification, you have to attend all of them. But if you need to be absent, at least for one, you let the state ombudsman know in advance that, okay, you're going to be absent because things do happen, you know. Uh, so they, you know, we make, and what do we do here? We look at, you know, uh, training topics that are very important, that are, you know, uh, we do as the North Carolina Association of Long-Term Care Ombudsman, Regional Ombudsman. What are the training needs that you need? They give us that list throughout the year. So we look at that list, and we try to provide speakers, you know, taking, you know, uh, speaking from that list also. And we at the state office also look, sit back, we look at you know some of the training needs that we think we need to you know uh, you know give to our folks also. So you know so that is how we have those meetings you know uh, you know. And then we have what I have what is called the scheduled visit to regions. Um, I believe in you know meeting the regional ombudsman on their own turf. Uh, for me to sit back in rally at the capital and just meet with them once a quarter. I won't get to know them, they won't get to know me. So I believe in getting out of the office, traveling to their regions, sitting down with them, meeting their AAA directors, you know, getting to know them one on one, you know, as opposed to just meeting them once a quarter. And then we have the technical assistance where the regional ombudsman might call the state ombudsman, uh, they need guidance, they want some interpretation from you, and we do some research and things of that nature. And sometimes we contact the, uh, the sender also, you know, if we try to provide, you know, uh, information. Sometimes we might even go to a uh, Cindy Deporter, you know, uh, the, the, the survey chief, you know, because we work together, you know, we do trainings for them, they do training for us also, you know, and we participate in regional events. Um, one of the things I also like to do is, you know, we encourage, you know, people like the state also here, we need to get to, we need to get out. Uh, to the uh, to the region, where they, they might be having an event on training or whatever, you know, and you know, just sit down there, support them, show that we support them, uh, you know, and uh, you know, we don't have to be the speakers. We simply register, get in there, sit down with them, speak with them, and things of that nature. And then when I look at the external group, also the presentation to the AAA directors, they meet um, uh, by monthly. And then you know, uh, no, they meet monthly. One uh, each one month, they do it you know by teleconferencing. Then the next, the the second month, it's in person. And then what we've been asked to do is, 
they invite the division of regional and other services at director the, the, uh, the, the second case in, uh, 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 you know, to that meeting. And you know, we started last month whereby you know, the state ombudsman and someone from our office, we go in there, talk for about 15 minutes about the ombudsman's program. The last one we did, uh, I think about four weeks ago, um, I went through the, everything about the final rule. Even though we have presented it to them before, we went back again and gave them an update about uh, the final rule. Um, we include the AAA directors in ad hoc committees. Uh, we have something here called the work group for the final rule. Uh, it's about uh, 16, about 16 members strong. Uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, AAA directors. Uh, you know, uh, on that committee. Again, you know, they represent all the 16 AAA directors, you know, so but we think, you know, that gives them a voice, and one of them is a liaison to the, um, uh, to the commissioners as well. Uh, and we attend community events, we serve on panels, and we participate in teleconferences. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. The challenge is here. Uh, the challenge is, you know, uh, just like Ken said also, this is a very vast state. 100 counties, 16 regions, it is a challenge. Uh, I, 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 as, I, as much as I love to get to every one of them, you know, I, I'm going to try to get to the, uh, you know, I can travel to all the 100 counties, but at least I can get to the 16 regions, you know. Uh, either through monitoring, we monitor about four regions every year, and then, you know, go to some of the events and things of that nature. The challenge also is what the programmatic versus personal oversight. Everything that has to do with the program, the state long-time care ombudsman has supervision. And then the personal oversight belongs to the AAA. And that is the way the statute is written also. Uh, North Carolina General Statute 141, the BO-181, that is the way it's written. We have programmatic oversight they have the personnel oversight. And then we've got the budget challenges as well. Uh, once upon a time when I first got here, uh, Sharon was in the heat of, you know, uh, of, of, of a discussion with a um, couple AAA directors because they were saying that, okay, there was not enough money for the uh, regional ombudsman to, to travel out and visit the facilities. That is the core function of what we do. So, you know, uh, Sharon really had to go at them you know, and things of that nature that, okay, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to move some money around because you do get the in-kind, you get everything, you know, you get the indirect, you know, so you should be able to move some money around. The conflict of interest also, uh, we have it in the policy where any hiring they do, they should let us know. They should, you know, they should convince, you know, a new, uh, new, new individual, you know, about conflict of interest. And then again, ongoing basis, if a regional ombudsman thinks that, okay, well, I do have, you know, someone in, in, in you know, my, my grandma is in long-term care facility or, you know, my in-law is in a you know, long-term care facility, definitely I cannot investigate something there, you know. So to the extent that we don't know, that might be, that might be a problem. And then the annual evaluations. Uh, what we like to see is for the uh, AAA directors at least to contact us and seek input from us, you know. Uh, since I've been here, I think about three AAA directors have contacted me seeking input into the uh, annual evaluation for the uh, regional ombudsman. And then local allegiance, it is something that we cannot underestimate. That is something I'm also telling you, don't underestimate it, because, you know, uh, in some rural, in some you know, smaller uh, communities also, these are people who have a group together. So all of a sudden, one is a AAA director, one is a regional ombudsman, and then here comes the state long time care ombudsman, and you're telling them, you know, you want to break this up. No, you're not going to break it up. It's just like we have people in the uh, division, Department of Social Services, we have adult care home specialists, you know, people who come together, who fish together, and everything, and we saying, hey, when you come to work, discontinue your body-body system. It doesn't work that way. Next slide, please. Okay. What are some of the opportunities? I think, uh, you know, um, I, I do appreciate and I feel very blessed that, okay, well, I, I, I'm bringing into this job, you know, my experience within a state unit on aging. 
uh, where all the uh, ombudsmen uh, are state employees into an area where some of us are state employees and some are employed by you know triple A's. Even though they are housed there, they still have you know uh, they, they still report to the state long term care ombudsman. Um, so that the no Carolina state structure and AA structure. Sometimes I think it's centralized, and sometimes I think it's being centralized. And then we have the regional ombudsman. This is a very, very, very important, you know, uh, attribute here. Regional ombudsman. They are skilled. They are experienced. And then one of the things we do here is, you know, when people, uh, clients, contact us from the field, from the state, from everywhere, we don't jump into those things. What we do. We triage, we channel the uh, 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 that complaint back to the respective uh, regional ombudsman who has jurisdiction in that county. Um, and then you know my ability also to contact other state ombudsmen across the uh, uh, across the um, uh, across the country. I remember when I first became the state ombudsman in Delaware, where I contacted Carol one night. You know. She said, you still at work, you just started. <laughs> okay. But you know, so I think that opportunity to that, you know, uh, viability, you know, uh, Amity, Laurie, you know, all of them, you know, where I can just pick up the phone, contact them, contact them and everything. I think that's a very uh, you know, that's an important asset. And that's something to each one of you should be able to utilize, you know, that network, the website, you know, and particularly remember living on the website because there's a lot of information on the website. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, who are the people who give me support here? Uh, the elder rights chief, that's my immediate boss, you know, and I think I'm lucky uh, in the fact that, okay, uh, she used to be a non-bosman program specialist, so she's very familiar with the terrain. Uh, she used to work as a CSEP, you know, uh, administrator, so she's very, you know, very familiar, and she's on the, uh, on the state uh, division of agency leadership team, you know. Uh, our elder rights specialist, she used to be a regional ombudsman. She joined the program um, about uh, in April. You know what was interesting was you know when Sharon, um, uh, three of us in the state unit on aging, I uh, mean in the office here, yeah, one person retired last October, so it remained you know uh, Sharon and I <laughs> were the only two left, and then Sharon retired too. So I was the only person in the state office who was managing the program. So you know. Uh, so I'm glad that the, you know Laura Jane is here now. Uh, the regional ombudsman, you know, they give a lot of support. You know, I pick up the phone, give them a call. Also, uh, what's your input? How do you suggest we should do this? You know, I try to to yield leadership because I don't have all the answers. I yield leadership. They come from that, you know, that that part of the state. They know the terrain. They know the landscape. So I do ask them, you know, uh, what do you suggest we do? I do, you know, I I don't purport to be the, you know. Uh, they, they, they know it all and everything, you know. I ask them also. Uh, the my director, the for the aging unit, and then the assistant director. They very involved. They very involved with the work group that we have for the final rule, you know. Uh, the legal services developer, uh, Lynn Berry, uh, room is next door to me. Our office is next door to me here. Uh, the Chipotle directors, you know. Yes, you know. They we, we communicate with each other also, and other stakeholders as applicable. One of them, you might know, the land, you know. Very active, you know, uh, within the within the network, you know, uh, is you know, yeah, is is still very active and offers me a lot of support as well too. Next slide, please. Okay, so advice to all ombudsmen. I think it's important to get to know stakeholders, you need to get connected. Uh, I don't believe in just sitting in the office here, yeah, uh, rally, you know. Yes, I believe I need to get out there, uh, get to know the. Uh, uh, you know, you know, get to know the uh, the folks and everything. You know, something interesting happened this morning. You know, um, one of the there was something in the newspaper about um, and uh, you know the, uh, the the care and everything in uh, in adult care home. You know, I contacted the um, regional ombudsman right away. When is your next visit to this facility? You know, because I want to go there with her just to see exactly what is going on. And I believe I travel some of the. To some of the facilities throughout the uh, throughout the state, and you know that is something I think uh, I will suggest that you know get out, get to know your folks, talk to people, uh, emphasize the role of the ombudsman. I think uh, many people out there don't know what we do. Uh, when you talk about abuse reporting, 
And some people in the uh, in APS in our division here don't even understand that we work for our clients are the residents. Uh, we get consent from the residents before we do anything. They don't understand that. So the by and large, we got to get out there and educate people about what we do. Uh, we got to let them know that the focus is resident. We work for the resident. You know, we work for the resident. That's our goal. Uh, we got to listen to others and try to understand their position. You know, yes, they might you know they might think we are non-team players because that's the way they they look at us sometimes. Because you got to have it this way, you know. No, it's not because we got to have it that way. We've got to have it that way because of our clients, the resident. Uh, so we got to listen to other people and then just explain our own, uh, you know, our own position also. And something that is very, very vital is upholding the code of ethics for ombudsman. Okay. If you look at the twelve elements in that code of ethics, I think it, you know, it, it's an umbrella. It summarizes everything we do. You know, code of ethics, ombudsman. It summarizes everything we do. I think if you can subscribe to that, I think you know, uh, you will be on your way to being a successful ombudsman. And I think the ombudsman network is also available to you. You know, everybody you have on the uh, on this on this webinar today. You know, uh, and all the ombudsman state ombudsmen who are not available today. Yeah, you can always pick up the phone. You can always get on the email and contact each and every one of them. You know, I have learned, you know, they have lived it and I know how they are, they will respond to you. Okay, next slide please. Okay. Uh what are the benefits of building relationship? Okay. So when we look at it, you know, okay, you know, good working relationship, you know, uh the if you build a relationship even within your state union or nation, you know, in within your network, you know, within the regional ombudsman, when you need if you have a question, you need something, you can just walk up to them and talk to them. They are willing to help you. Uh, what it does is it leads to effective collaboration. And then, you know, what does that do? I think, you know, it leads to effective advocacy for residents. And that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line, effective advocacy. I recall when I first became the state ombudsman in Delaware, one of the things, you know, the, uh, the nursing home association and the ombudsman's office were at long ahead. And I went to their meeting, I just told them point blank. We don't need to draw a line in the sand. I don't need to draw a line in the sand. When we do that, guess who is suffering? The residents. So let's put the synergy together and let's go ahead. And that's one of the things, you know, I'm also trying to do here, you know, in terms of the associations, you know, I'm you know trying to get out there, you know, get them to know me. I want to get to know them, get to understand, you know, we I, I, like I tell them. We will not agree on everything, but at least we will dialogue, and then, you know that's something I hang my hat on. Yes, I will not agree with you on everything, but one thing I guarantee you is we will dialogue. Next slide. Yeah, I think that is the that is the end of it. You know, thank you very much. It's been an opportunity, and then thank you for letting me speak to this group today. Thank you so much, Victor. Again, a lot of good ideas. Um, we are. Uh, we have plenty of time for um, questions. I am going muted. Um, I am going to. I am going to unmute everyone um, and open it up to anyone. So, if you've got any background noise um, in your office, uh, try to. Try to stay away from that. Um, some of you, I'm not being successful in unmuting. So, Joni, I was not able to unmute you. Um, does anybody have a? Oh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, that's the submarine. That's the submarine. And Sh Sherry, I'm not able to unmute you. Um, and. Joni, I'm not able to unmute you, so you guys must have done something special. So the rest of you are all live. Does anybody have any questions or comments or Anne or Amity or Katie? Any any words of wisdom? Sorry, I gave too many instructions there. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Oh, 
Wow, you guys must have wowed them. Um, comments. Somebody want to just say something so I'll know that you can that we can hear you. Hello. Oh, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, that this whole um, idea of the network um, is so important that um, as you guys come across uh, questions from your regional folks, local folks, um, it, every state ombudsman, most of most state ombudsmen have been through something similar and you just need to know that um, unlike maybe any other job you've had, um, this particular group becomes very close-knit because they understand what you're being, you know, what the locals are asking or, or whatever. So um, you've got two great people who spoke today who um, can and you can talk to plus um, your individual mentor and then just about anybody else. So comments, questions, thoughts. Hello, Carol. Mark? Hey. Is that you, Mark? Yes, it is. I, I was trying to figure out how to make my thing work here. I was a little challenged. I, I just ah. want to thank you to Ann and, and Victor. You know, I've I've been a new state ombudsman three times now, and there's always, <laughs> well, there's always more to learn, right? I, I can't hold a job. What can I say? Um, <laughs> but it, I, I think hearing them talk about this actually was very helpful in talking about not only building relationships, but I, I think, you know, trusting yourself in the work that you, uh, that, that you do. Um, it, it's just a, it's, it, it was just a great um, a great reminder, and I was having that conversation with Patty Ducaye earlier this week. That no matter what, there will only ever be 53 of us, and sometimes it can be a little lonely, and you're wondering if you're doing the right thing. And it's I think it's important to you know maintain contact with with each other um, for support because sometimes it can feel like you're the only person going through this when nobody's agreeing with you, and you feel like the odd man out, and you don't fit in your agency, and and all that. So, um, the only thing I would add that over, I, I, and it's taken me a while to get to this point, it's okay to say no to certain things. Um, I think through the course of time, folks come to you and we become like, well, the ombudsman can do this or that. And I've learned that it's okay to say no once in a while. You know, and to focus your, kind of like Victor was saying, you, you, you focus your efforts on, on the resident. And, uh, and and that's the important thing, and not get pulled away to do other other jobs. Mark, this is Ann, and I, I appreciate you picking up on that point and and underscoring it. Um, working here in an advocacy agency, we recently we have a what we're terming a nursing home project, and we've been trying to figure out what to do with our money follows the person program, and. Uh, you know, you talk to people in protection and advocacy, and if I feel lonely as the state ombudsman, well, they feel lonely too. There are two people who work on behalf of all people with mental illness in all residential settings, and you know, one and a half people who work on behalf of all kids in special ed. So we look thick on the ground with advocates to my colleagues here, in terms of having you know 65 people, and so you know they were saying, let's deploy the local ombudsman. And they can go around and figure out where the MDS is indicating people want to leave and the referrals aren't being made. We could get a lot of great information. But in a decentralized program, these people are not my employees, so I can't deploy them anywhere. And um, you know, maybe or maybe not they'd be interested in that next to all the other work they're doing. And uh, you know, I'm kind of interested in that too, but um, it would be a very small piece of work that is already getting accomplished. And so it was saying no to my colleagues here at Disability Law Colorado and um, agreeing to, to for, you know, put forward a request for people to, you know, if they notice a situation where somebody wants to move and it's not happening, dig a little bit and send it to me and I'll send it to the PNA and, 
um, but you know, no, even to colleagues and allies, no, sometimes. That's yeah, that's the nursing we, home project work. Not yeah. we, we just did that, I, I just did that last week here in, in DC, and I'm sure I'm not making a lot of friends right away, but there's a National Falls Prevention Day, which is a, a great thing, and but it's fairly community-based, um, you know, where they're doing assessments and home safety checklists and things like that, which is wonderful. And I so they but they came to us and wanted our resources and to buy bags and use our staff and all that. And I said, well, are you going into facilities and doing falls prevention assessments and everything? No, I hadn't thought about that. And so, you know, it was one of those things where it's like, well, it doesn't really touch the people that we're most obviously concerned about. So, um, you know, I was, I was, you know, just didn't want to devote a lot of time and resources that we don't have to, to that effort. And I'm, like I said, I'm sure I did make a lot of friends doing that, but it didn't look like it was going to advance our mission or serve, you know, the residents that we have a responsibility to. So, yeah. Great example, yeah. So, if let's, um, Victor, do you have any last thoughts? Um, I think uh, the you know I'm looking at your uh, the, the last bullet point there. Yeah. You know, you say Victor and the National Bosnian Resource Center. Uh, we cannot overemphasize the importance of these two right here: the mentor and then the uh, the center. Uh, I think, like I said earlier, uh, when I first became the state ombudsman in Delaware, I practically lived on the website for information and everything. And you know, between then and now, I even see, you know, I've seen the, you know, the, the vast number of information available there. It is a place you can always go and get information. Uh, don't ever underestimate that center. Go in there, any information you want, you can get in there, and if you can't find it, I'm sure I'm with Katie and call, you know, Carol, they'd be glad, you know, uh, to, to assist you. But a lot of information are available there. Yeah. Great, thank you. Anne? Oh, this is always hard. I, I just, feel free, it is such a warm network, please feel free to just reach out and, and you know, grab a hold of anyone. Um, I early on had a confidentiality question and I called NORC and they said, well, you need to call this person. They wrestled with it recently and they probably have some good things to tell you. But just use those advocacy skills and be persistent. You're going you're gonna to get what you need if you keep asking for it. Great. Um, Amity, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you think you'd <laughs> like I'm to say? To. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's just my boss. Hi, I, I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Excellent webinar. Um, thanks for putting me on the spot. I really should have rethought that whole video shot at the very beginning, but I <laughs> thanks for doing that. Um, I, I just want to reiterate that there's never, you know, a, a question that hasn't been asked before. So really, don't be shy. Ask anything. That's the only way that we all learn, and we all learn together. Um, no matter how many years you have on a job, just like Mark said earlier, you know, this is his third time as a new state ombudsman and he has a lot of experience, but he's still finding new nuggets of information or just a new way to look at things. The more you listen and the more you attend training and talk to your peers and, of course, us at the Resource Center. So don't be shy. I think we're a friendly group. Certainly reach out and, and we want to hear from you. It helps us learn and grow as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sarah, do you want to say something? She's like, oh no, where's my mute button? Exactly, that's it. What I was doing was trying, I had muted myself after you unmuted me. <laughs> I think the only thing that I would like to underscore is just the importance of going out and visiting the local ombudsman as much as possible. And as Anne said, it was an ambitious goal on her part and took her a little bit longer than she expected. But I remember as a new ombudsman, someone giving me that tip when I was a state ombudsman. 
and it made a huge impact and a huge difference, and especially if you are able to do that apart from a, mo a required monitoring kind of visit. Even if you come from the ombudsman program and have been a peer of some of the local ombudsmen and now you're the state ombudsman, for you to take the time and haul it across the state from the state office and sit in their world and have them talk, take you to a facility or two and just get to see them in their office and hear their perspective, I think it will go a long way toward building relationships and helping you do the things that Anne and Victor were talking about, which is identify the leaders and the expertise and will perhaps give you a little different perspective on individuals you've worked with for a number of years. And if you are from outside the network, it at least lets them know that you care enough to see physically what their office looks like, the challenges they have, and hear their perspective and their take on the role. I've had, a, and we at NORC have had a number of newer state ombudsmen tell us later that they really didn't see the point in doing all that and it seemed like not such a high priority in light of everything else they needed to do, but once they did it, it really opened their eyes to what they needed to focus on in terms of training or building relationships or policies and procedures, as well as really helped mold them into a unified network instead of kind of, well, who does she think she is or who does he think he is to sit up there and develop policies and tell us how we need to be reporting. So I just think that's the thing that we keep hearing really from people who've done it and say that they're so glad they do, as well as that's probably one of the biggest gripes we hear from local ombudsmen about their state ombudsmen. They don't understand. They don't come to see us. They don't know what we're up against. And that's just a good way to use your newness to the role to try to build a bridge over some of those crevices that may evolve later or make it easier when you do have to make a decision that not everybody agrees with. So, Carol, you probably think, okay, she had to unmute herself, but I'm going back on it. <laughs> okay. Well, as, as always, Sarah has such good information. You'll see on a lot of the resource uh, resources on the website that Sarah is the author, um, and so we uh, much appreciate um, much appreciate uh, having her as a consultant with uh, with NORC. Um, Amity, were you going to say something else? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, and I'm glad that Sarah brought that up. Um, for those of you that are new, new, and I haven't met yet, I used to be a local ombudsman, and I just, from the flip side of you know all of your experience as a state ombudsman, it does mean a lot, not just the initial introduction and get to know you, but to keep them involved as much as possible and in close contact, even if it just means, hey, this is what's going on at the state level or federal level, get involved, or you can do this, and passing down information. It's really important to just maintain that connection. So just wanted to reiterate that. It goes a long way. Great. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things to wrap up. One, um, we will be having an orientation session at the Consumer Voice Conference in November. Um, it'll be Wednesday, November the 2nd in the morning. Um, the afternoon then is the NASOP meeting. So I'm um, hope, hoping that you all will, uh, if you're coming to Consumer Voice, that you will make plans to join us in the morning for the uh, orientation and then in the afternoon for the NASOP meeting. Um, second is um, you will be receiving a survey um, about uh, today's webinar. There's only five questions. And um, so if you could just take a second and uh, give us your feedback. We will be conducting another one of these webinars um, early um, in 2017. If you have um, thoughts about what, um, uh, what you'd like us to touch on, um, please let us know. And we'll um, have a, another new ombudsman orientation in the spring at the annual uh, conference and uh, um, just to let you know that um, uh, we, we talk about being new or nearly new and as you heard Ann say she's on two and a half years and she's not sure yet if she's ready to step out you know on her own so people are welcome at any time for any of the orientation sessions to be a part of this so I want to thank um, 
Anne and, and Victor and um, for speaking today and want to just uh, say that um, we are here to, to help and support you so that you can help and support your local programs and that all of us uh, can stay focused on that resident. So thank you all and um, safe uh, travels as you go out to visit your local programs. Thank you. And thank you, Scott. Thank you. Carol? Thanks, everybody. Judy, thank you. Have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you.